Good afternoon, everyone. This is Adam Green from ATA Engineering. Um, welcome to this um, webinar presenting uh, Frisbee simulation using Star CCM Plus. Um, I'm joined by Peter Newman, one of our um, Star CCM Plus technical guys at ATA. Peter, you want to say hi? Hi, folks. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and, and we're going to walk through some of the work that he's done over the last um, few weeks or months on, on a Frisbee simulation. But before we do that, I'm going to do a, um, an introduction to ATA together with some descriptions about Star CCM Plus and, and really why it's so good for this application. So let's get started. And so ATA Engineering. Okay. Um, basically, ATA Engineering, is, we're an employee and small business. Um, started out in California. We have over 200 staff and really we are a very um, highly skilled um, bunch of folk. We have over 15 years average experience um, with a lot of PhDs and masters on staff. And really um, the work we do um, as, as engineering consultants is basically the very hard work and very high end work that, that um, other people sometimes can't do. And the industries that we work in, really aerospace and, and spacecraft are a very big part of what we do. Um, but we also work in others, hypersonics and composites, defense and maritime. And also when we have a themed entertainment division where sometimes security is almost as strict as some of the others. And so what do we actually do? And, and historically, ATA started life almost 25 years ago now um, as, as a, a group doing mostly test. Um, but over the years, we've done a lot more analysis and a lot more design. Um, and, and that's helped along because we, we are now working with Siemens and been working with them for some time. And we really use all of those tools in pretty much all of those groups, the design analysis and test side of things. And we have offices in, throughout the U.S., mostly in the kind of aerospace centers of the country. I mean, you can see where those are, but we also hopefully will have a new one soon in, in Boston, which is where I'm based. And so ATA is a, a platinum level um, solution partner for Siemens. And that means where the, where the highest level there is. That's, that's highest in terms of revenue. It's also highest in terms of, of skill and expertise. And so, you know, we're a certified expert partner for um, for FEMAP Star and SimCenter 3D and others. And, and really, you know, if someone if someone needs help with Siemens tools, ATA has the, the skills and the bandwidth to really deliver, um, you know, exactly what people need. And we have the dedicated hotline support. We have a very close relationship with Siemens on the, on the Nash Trans side and NX as well, really based on the history of ATA relative to NX. And so um, we have a lot of training material and, and we're, we're the Siemens preferred training provider for those products. So we're very closely connected with Siemens. And as we've grown over the years, we, we've extended the, the products we use from, from Siemens, especially on SimCenter. And SimCenter 3D, FEMAP and Nashtran and Star have been the standard ones, but Heeds and AIMSIM recently have been added to, to the, the skills that we have. And now, and now we use those extensively. Um, and, and lastly, the, the test and management side of things, you know, Siemens has a big group doing test and measurement and an ATA has a lot of skills in, in that department too. And so ATA is, is the, the, the main reseller for test and measurement in the US. And so if anyone needs any, anything in that regard, we can advise on, on all of the Siemens products together with, with services to support that. And all of this information can be found on our website, um, ata-e.com. You can click the, the software link and, and, and dive into more details. A lot of good resources there, a lot of, of training and other things to, to help you out. And so today I'm going to talk a couple of things. And, and normally our webinars are always um, fairly serious affairs in terms of we're, we're, we're tackling some, some high intensity um, aerospace pro projects. But today is a little lighter. We're, we're going to look at a Frisbee model. And a lot of our team, certainly in California, um, play ultimate. It's not ultimate Frisbee, apparently. But it's but then so there's a lot of interest in the, the aerodynamics of, of Frisbees. Um, and so Peter has certainly um, done some of that and is very interested in the topic. But also a lot of others at ATA are. So we're going to be talking about that. I'll, I'll introduce the history of the Frisbee a little bit, which kind of is, is surprising and amusing. Um, and then we'll talk about why STAR is, is relevant for this application and, and what makes it really effective to do it. And then I'll pass the ball to Peter and, and he can dive into much more detail and depth on, on his model of, of looking at modeling a Frisbee, um, the actual trajectory, 
um, and looking at, at Wobble as it's moving as an impact on actually performance of the Frisbee. So it's pretty, it's pretty good stuff. And so the history of Frisbee is interesting. Apparently in, in the late 1800s and, the, and up to 1958, there was a company in Connecticut called the Frisbee Pie Company. Um, and they made pies that were, were distributed about New England to, to various, you know, normally high-end colleges. And after they were the pies had been eaten, they they were they came in a tin tray um, with with the words frisbee pies on the bottom, um, and they would they would basically play with them. And, and basically, many colleges throughout the, the New England area, including in Yale. Um, they decided that they were the originators of the Frisbee, but that's certainly up for debate. Who was the, the first college that actually um, first to fling, but either way, ma many claim it. And so here's what the, the original pie looked like, and this is why you can you can visualize why they're so good at, at you know, throwing them and, and making them into a flying disc. Um, and so a guy named Richard Kerr was, was basically, he saw this and he, he saw how much fun they were having and kind of commercialized it but didn't want to use the Frisbee name as it was on the, on the baking company. So he changed it to, to Frisbee with two E's, really, so he could get a trademark. Um, and soon after, basically, you know, he, he, his company, Whammo, they did really well. And in 1964, the first professional model went on sale. So it's been around a long while, you know, almost 50 years. And an, another guy at the Whammo company who, who was also, a, you know, a designer and an inventor, Ed Hedrick, he did some work to improve it after the first disc was was mostly a flat plastic disc, and he put ridges on on the on the disc to give it a lot more stability during flight. Now I know Peter hasn't done this in his model, so we we did debate doing a second version with ridges to see if if you know it would change the trajectory, but but we'll we'll talk about that later. Um, but basically the bottom line is 50, 50 years ago um, it was it was. Um, sold to, to so not 50 years ago by Mattel toys um, and really they've sold a lot since then so over 100 million frisbees um, before they sold it to Mattel so Whammo did pretty well and really uh, it's quite an amazing story so let's look at why Star CCM Plus is so good for this application um, even though on the surface the application seems pretty simple when you dive into it obviously you've got a disc going through the air it's rotating um, and the dynamics of that are, are quite complex from a, from a modeling perspective. Um, but STAR has plenty of tools to make that accessible. Um, I'm going to talk about that a little more now. So when we look at the, the libraries of, of you know, pieces in STAR that can, can tackle this problem, for some reason, oh, there you go, these videos make this slow to load. Um, but if you look at this, this motion and mesh ad adaptations within STAR, the list is very long, and we could talk for hours about this if we wanted to, but we're not going to do that today. We're going to really focus on, on a couple of things. And, and the main one is rotorcraft. I know it's a Frisbee, but it has a lot of uh, analogy to, to rotorcraft and, and the, the methodologies used to model those. So if we look at this center one here, um, you can see the, um, the, the modeling of, of helicopter blades and, and, and the fuselage is, is very um, capable of doing that in Star CCM+. Plus. And so... If we look into a bit more detail about if we want to do rotorcraft, um, you know, what are the things that we can do? And, and rotating and, and translating devices is really what a, I mean, it almost defines a Frisbee. Um, and so, you know, Siemens has done in the past a lot of helicopter and, and rotorcraft modeling, and the, the Osprey V22 is one of those. And obviously, it's a complex model. Um, but, but really looking at pr propulsion systems, pretty much the whole, the whole dynamics of the vehicle can be done with Star CCM Plus. And, and you know, it's not to be undertaken lightly because there's a lot of things going on in a model like this. And when you look at the tools within STAR, wh which pieces are, are relevant? And really, when we look at mesh motion, we, we've got three uh, kind of technologies that, that can help us do mesh, mesh motion. Um, and really, the first one is sliding mesh and, and visualize you know, a, a, a cylinder inside a bigger mesh that can rotate, and then the, the blades can be inside that cylinder that can rotate with the, separate to the rest of the mesh. And often um, a, a rotorcraft model looks like that. Um, but you can also do mesh morphing, and you can also do overset mesh. In overset mesh, which is the, the video, uh, the animation on the bottom there, you know, you've got two meshes that can move against each other, but the actual meshes are not changing. And so that's sometimes computationally very efficient because you don't have to remesh at each step. If you look at the, 
the the other one, the middle one, which is mesh morphing, pretty much you're you're doing a mesh, a remesh, you know, almost every time step to, based on the conditions of the flow. So so that's a little more intensive compute wise, but it's that you can still do it in star depending on the the application. And so if we if we kind of dive in a little more into um, rotorcraft as a whole, uh, this is an animation from star of um, the rotor blade experiencing aeroelastic effects. And so that is, this is a fluid interaction problem. And, and really, you know, for those who, who are uh, CFD practitioners in the audience, you know how hard this problem is. It's, it's FSI, it's, it's structural changes of the blade together with the, the CFD modeling of the whole system. So it's, it's a pretty intense calculation um, to be able to predict the motion of the blade, the forces on the blade, the, the changes in geometry of the blade based on those forces, all as a, a fluid structure interaction problem. So, um, you know, th this is more complex than we need to do for, for the, the disk model, but we certainly had a discussion about does the, does the, frisbee, the frisbee change shape during flight? And obviously it does, but I think Peter for this example didn't take that into account because it would have added a lot of time and compute resources to the project. Um, so, but but certainly more the the, the FSI and the, and the mesh morphing is is very applicable to this. And so, I I think I would consider this almost the ultimate CFD model that I've seen in recent years. If if we if we look at this model, it's a, it's a Coast Guard helicopter, U.S. Coast Guard, and and when you look at the model, you can you can just trying to visualize the CFD you know mesh around this. You've got you've got the mesh associated with the rotating disc of the blade. You've got the fuselage. And and the whole thing is moving forward at you know maybe two hundred knots. So, um, th when you look at some of the data that showed in this showed in this animation, you can see that this is a full model of this helicopter. It's full um, FSI on the blades, and you can actually see the displacement of the blades relative to the to the static location as it's traveling around. You can see the pressure coefficient as it remember it's going forward. You can see the change in force on the blades. Um, and and really gives you a, a full picture of the dynamics of this this blade going through. Um, what's nice about this animation is this is the same data from a different view. From the top view, again displacement and, and pressure on the on the fuselage. But in a second, it's going to show us the 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 displacement of the blade. You can see that shadow is the static location of the blade, and then you can see the the actual magnitude of the of the changes. But then if you, if you keep watching this, we we'll see that that this is what I wanted to show you the the mesh. The mesh topology of, of how this is put together. It's a rotating mesh with a with a mesh that can rotate inside the other rotating mesh. So it's pretty complex. And and really, when you think about this, how many people could actually have the compute capacity to model this? And so, you know, that brings us on to really our next subject. And the next subject is how do I get the compute capacity to actually do some of these things? Um, and and Siemens has a nice solution for that. And a recent um, product called Cloud HPC. And, and Cloud HPC is, is really um, an extension of Star CCM Plus that lets a user expand to use the AWS Cloud very quickly and easily. <clears throat> and so it, it really relies on the idea that somebody is 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 locally, and, and this is a kind of a schematic on Amazon, but but this is, you know, if if you if you want to run um in the cloud then I think people generally know that the benefits of running in the cloud, but historically it's still not been straightforward to say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna migrate my workloads to the cloud. You still need to learn a lot. Um, and Siemens have tried to, to take out that learning curve and they've done a really good job. So, so um, Cloud HPC really gives you instant access really without any knowledge of AWS to expand your workloads straight to the cloud. And so, I really, you know, we've had customers who, who you know, are working on you know, reasonable workstations, but suddenly they get a big project where they need some some burst capacity, um, and Cloud HPC really gives them a good a good solution for that, where they can get up to 750 cores on AWS pretty much instantly, and so it's working very well, and and so really, you know, this is why why do that, and it gives you a bit about the workflow. You purchase credit up front. Um, you, you can submit jobs straight from the desktop application, and, that, and that's what makes it nice. So really, if you're sat in your office working on, on Star in, in a regular environment and you do need to expand, you really don't need to do anything. You just need to, to submit the job to the cloud and the rest is taken care of for you, which almost sounds too good to be true, but it is very simple. Um, and so if we look at this 
animation here. This is an animation of the Star CCM Plus GUI. And this is a, just a kind of a, a regular um, pump model of a fairly complex mesh. But And someone says, OK, well, now I need to run it on a lot more cores than I've got locally. It is literally as simple as saying, submit this job to the HPC cloud, choosing the number of cores you want, and clicking submit. Now, now there is obviously the, the data transfer time to get a star model from your local machine up to AWS. And sometimes those are big, and sometimes that can take a few minutes or, or more. But, but nonetheless, it's still, it's very simple and really the user needs to have no experience of, of using AWS to be able to use Cloud HPC, which what which is what makes it really good. So I know Peter has used this in this model and I think he's going to talk about that in his presentation. So, so with that in mind, I'm going to wrap up and um, on to Frisbees. Uh, I thought that was a profound line, but but Chris Stoich decided to make us a cool animation um, of me passing the ball to Peter. So Peter, over to you um, to, to talk about the, the, the nuts and bolts and the details of this simulation. Sounds good. Thanks for the intro, Adam. All righty. Um, so this is the beginning of the, the technical work um, that I did in modeling an ultimate Frisbee flight in Star CCM Plus. Um, so first to kind of address the elephant in the room. This is a pretty common question when someone talks about ultimate or frisbees is uh, defining the difference between ultimate frisbee and disc golf. Uh, so ultimate frisbee is a team non-contact field sport. Uh, it's very dynamic. It involves a lot of running, jumping, throwing, catching. Um, and disc golf is, a, a, it's in the name, it's a golf-like sport in which the goal is to minimize the number of throws um, to land a disc inside a basket. Um, so they're very different sports in terms of how they're played, but they do rely on some same basic physics in terms of how a disc flies through the air. Um, and as they're played very differently, they have different discs to serve different purposes. So Ultimate generally relies on a single disc, and that has been for the last 30 years, since 1991, the Discraft Ultrasar. Um, and the design is pretty unlikely to change in the near future. People are pretty attached to this disc, and it's been around for a long time. Um, in disc golf, they use a wide variety of different discs for different purposes, whether you want to maximize distance or control. Um, and there's a wide range of designs, materials, and manufacturers. Um, so in, in the disc golf space, there may be more industrial application for STAR in terms of design optimization and exploration. Um, but for our case in Ultimate, it's then that's you know maybe more so what I'm interested in as a player of Ultimate is how can we optimize the throwing motion. So again, the design of the Ultra Star is unchanging. So the question is more how can we optimize this throwing motion? Um, we have a set of initial throw conditions that can pretty much describe the vast majority of different types of throws. Uh, we have velocity, angle of attack. Uh, pitch angle relative to the ground, roll angle, and then the spin velocity in the plane of the disc. Um, but the problem with defining an optimal throw is that it can be very subjective and context dependent. Uh, whether or not you want a fast and direct throw, a slow and lofted throw, or just maximum distance uh, can all depend on the situation within the game that you're playing. Um, so knowing that, I wanted to look at something outside of you know, maybe ideal throw conditions and investigate the impact of a non-ideal throw parameter that I'll identify as off-axis rotation. I'll also call it the wobble angle. Um, so to define that shortly, um, off-axis rotation is when the plane of rotation is outside of the actual disk plane. Um, so I have the disk plane shown on top of the disk and then a rotation plane slightly varied from that. And then the difference between the two is what we'll call the wobble angle. And to more practically show what that looks like, I have a couple animations. Um, the first animation is a disc with zero wobble angle. So it's rotating entirely within its own plane. And as you can see, it rotates. There's really no motion outside of that rotation. If the different sides were the same color, it would appear to be motionless. Um, when we have a disc with about 10 degrees of wobble angle, um, we see the disc is rotating, but then also moving. You can see the top of the disc, the bottom of the disc, 
Um, and to anyone who's learned to throw a Frisbee, uh, this probably looks pretty familiar because a lot of people, when they learn to throw, they have a lot of wobble in their throws. Um, this is not just a beginner issue. Um, Off-axis spin occurs at all levels of play. Uh, this is a short video of a very good player from one of the best um, semi-professional ultimate teams in North America. And you can see just after he releases the disc, there is a touch of wobble on. Um, so it's not just a beginner phenomenon. It occurs at all levels of play to some extent. Um, so I wanted to answer the question, what impact does this off-axis spin have on disc flight paths? And also identify when does it matter? Um, so there has been some prior work, prior literature related to Frisbees. And I'll be referencing an old, older thesis by Hummel from 2003. And they used an aerodynamic coefficient model derived from experiments in theory to predict the flight path of the disk. Um, and they provided two really useful um, resources for the basis of my simulations, um, both an initial set of throw conditions to use that describe a pretty moderate um, flat throw um, with you know the velocity, angle of attack, pitch angle, roll angle, and spin all defined, as well as a set of results, um, position and velocity in the x, y, and z directions versus time. Um, so I'll get to comparing some of my simulation data to that later on. Um, there are some limitations in this model um, in that it relies on experimental data and then extending that experimental data with theory. Um, and then it doesn't represent or can't represent all of the physics just by the nature of the model. So with that, what physics are required to predict flight paths in the modeling of an ultimate Frisbee? First, we need the aerodynamics to predict the drag, lift forces, and any moments on the disk. And from those, we need to predict the motion this in six degrees of freedom from those solved aerodynamic forces. So we need to define the translation and rotation of the disk. And these physics are strongly coupled as the motion of the disk from one instant to the next changes those flow conditions. STAR has a great tool for problems like these called dynamic fluid body interaction, or DFBI. And within each time step, star CCM plus applies the resultant forces and moments on the rigid body to solve the equations of motion and determine the position and orientation of the body. Um, so here we have the translation equations of motion and rotation equations of motion. And at least the translation equation should be pretty familiar, force equals mass times acceleration. Uh, the rotation equation is a little bit more complex, but it's essentially replacing the mass for moments of inertia, the forces with moments, and then the resultant that we get out of it is angular velocity. And it can be applied, or here's a quick example of how it can be applied. Um, and this example is an anchored boat contact in rough seas. So we can see these boats are the DFBI objects. They're interacting with the fluid and each other. You can have contact and constraints between different objects. And for our purposes, uh, we used a specific tool within the FBI um, called BFBI Embedded Motion. And this uses a sliding interface between inner and outer regions of the flow domain that are both coupled to our six degree of freedom bond. So this is a mesh cut plane kind of zoomed in to the disk where disk in the middle is our six degree of freedom body. Uh, this inner spherical region is going to translate and rotate with the disk. And this outer region is only going to translate with the disk. It doesn't rotate with it. And so this sliding interface in between the two is what communicates the information from this inner rotating region to the outer region that only translates. And here's a view of the entire flow domain where this pink box is the outer region and the yellow sphere is that inner region with the disk inside. And I'll talk briefly about how I developed this simulation. Um, I developed the initial flow conditions in a stationary reference frame, and then convert the flow field from absolute to a relative velocity. And then from there, I set up the DFBI embedded rotation and solve for the flight path of the disk. Uh, now, doing this every time for each model 
would be pretty time consuming and repetitive. Uh, so I have taken these steps in the middle and recorded them as a macro. So that essentially when I've developed the stationary or when I've developed the flow in the stationary reference frame, I can just play this macro with a click of the button and it will set up all that for me. And then I can just go on and run the DFBI simulation without having to manually set up everything every time. Um, so that's how the simulation is run. Um, but simulations can be computationally expensive, especially in CFD. And this model is no exception. Um, so in order to resolve the wall shear stresses with a low Y plus mesh, we ended up with a 1.3 million cell mesh. And this is a transient solution. And in order to run it um, with good stability, we used adaptive time stepping to limit the current number. And this yielded a typical time step of 0 0.0001 seconds. So over uh, an approximate three second flight, we're time stepping over 30,000 times and solving the equations of fluid motion and turbulence models on every cell in that mesh each time. And additionally, with multiple iterations per time step. So it's a very large calculation. And on my work desktop, this running in parallel on eight cores, each model took over six days to run, which if you're just running a one-off case, it's not so bad. But if you're interested in a parameter exploration or design optimization case, this is pretty prohibited. You wanna be able to run many models faster than this to get your results and understand how your parameters or design options affect your variables of interest. Um, so there are many solutions to reduce your runtime. Um, I'll touch on a few of them here. Uh, the first being, if you can reduce your mesh resolution and not lose important physics, doing that is great. Uh, for our purposes, the low Y plus mesh required to resolve the boundary layer and accurately simulate the physics prevented that. Uh, secondarily, you might be able to change your method to reduce turnaround times. Um, it might be possible to come up with an updated version of the coefficient model used by Hummel, or perhaps model some of the physics instead of directly resolving them. Um, but if that's not an option, you always have the ability to throw more compute resources at the problem to solve it faster. Um, so if you've got a local cluster, that's a great option, but it's not accessible to everyone. Um, cloud clusters are the option we're focusing on mainly today in context to SimCenter Cloud HPC. Um, it's a good option for extremely large meshes, and especially if you aren't going to be using it frequently, um, it's a good option because you only pay for it when you use it. You don't have any recurring costs associated with local, cl local clusters. Um, so Adam touched on this earlier, but this is what this interface looks like, and it's pretty seamless. You just select your cluster size, uh, drag and drop your simulation file. Um, and in our case, um, I used a macro, or let's see, yeah, cluster size, and you drag and drop your simulation file, and it has really smooth supporting options for macros. And I was using a macro for this ultimate Frisbee simulation. Um, so this is what that looked like um, when I submit this job, where get a laser pointer. Um, this is the simulation file um, before anything is run and any flow conditions have been developed. I have a main macro that essentially runs the simulation. And then that main macro is going to call the secondary macro that switches my reference frame and sets up DFBI. Um, so instead of having to stop and start the simulation and resubmit after setting up the DFBI, I can just set it to run and the macros will handle everything. So um, while it's running, you get an output similar to how you would get in you know, your local version of star CCM your time steps and iterations. Um, you can also monitor the job and look at any scenes or plots you have set up um, while the model is running. And once the model is complete, it'll output all of your files, uh, both the files that you initially submitted, such as the original run file and any macros. Um, but then it will also give you any simulation histories you've saved and a text version of the entire output. Um, so it's a really, SimCenter Cloud HPC is a great tool and it's very, very easy to use, but it's still important to understand the concept of parallel scaling when using it. 
Um, so this plot shows speed up from eight cores versus the number of cores. Um, so I've run this model both on my desktop on eight cores in parallel, on our local HPC on just 32 cores, and then SimCenter Cloud HPC on their current minimum of 141 cores. And so this orange line is an ideal linear speed up. Um, the idea is if you were to throw four times as many processors, you know, in an ideal world, it would run four times as fast. Um, and we don't see that in the real world. Um, as we can see, when we go from eight to 32 cores, there is some discrepancy between the linear speed up and the actual speed up. And when we move all the way out to 141 cores, there's a pretty significant discrepancy. Uh, and this is because as we have more cores, um, the cores need to communicate information between each other to appropriately solve the solution. And as you have more and more cores, they spend more and more time communicating between each other rather than actually solving. Um, so an important metric for determining parallel scaling and how effective that parallel scaling is going to be is your cells per core count. So running on my desktop is about 147,000 cells per core. And as we throw more cores at the problem, that core count gets lower and lower. Um, so as a general rule of thumb for efficient scaling, uh, it's good to stay above 50,000 cells per core. Uh, more cores will give you results faster, but less efficiently. Um, so the model running on my desktop on eight cores took over six days. The model running on local HPC and 32 cores took just under two days. And the model on SimCenter Cloud HPC took about 17 hours to run fully. Um, the smallest cluster is currently 141 cores that's expected to change and lower a little bit. Um, but at that current number, um, seven to 10 million cells in your mesh is a good decent minimum to efficiently utilize SimCenter Cloud HPC. Um, so with that, let's get a little bit into the results and what we, yeah, what we show from a throw of an ultimate Frisbee against our CCM. Um, so here's an initial throw um, and where we have some scenery to kind of show the motion of the disk. And then this gray center plane is the initial center plane of the velocity. So we can see how the throw deviates from left to right as it flies. Um, so we see here the disk is rotating counterclockwise and it actually deviates a little bit to the left side of that center plane and remains there for the duration of the flight, but it is sort of coming back towards the center line near the end. Um, and we compare this throw with no wobble to the results from that Hummel thesis, and they showed relatively decent agreement, especially considering that the models are so vastly different. Um, here we have the X position and velocity, as well as the Y and Z positions and velocity versus time. And we see generally that the shapes and characteristics of the disk, disk match up pretty well. Um, the magnitudes aren't all exactly the same, but considering the physics that CFD is able to capture compared to the coefficient model, it's pretty remarkable that they are this close. Um, so when we vary the wobble angle, um, we see some interesting results. So these are the actual flight paths of the disk. So this top XY flight path would be a bird's eye view of the disk, and the XZ flight path would be so sort of from the side. And as we can see, the zero degree wobble angle uh, goes the furthest and flies the straightest. And as we increase the wobble angle, it hits the ground earlier and deviates further to the side and doesn't really start to come back towards the center line at all. And similarly for the XZ flight path, um, we can see that the maximum height decreases as we increase the wobble angle. So this shows us that as the wobble angle increases, we see an initial positive side shift um, upwards of two meters for this throw. The distance decreases um, by about a third from the nominal case at 10 degrees of wobble angle. The max height decreases by a little over half a meter. Um, importantly, though, the flight path is relatively unchanged below 10 to 12 meters. So in the context of a short throw, perhaps the impact of the wobble angle is minimal. Um, so here's an animation that compares the 
zero degree nominal case versus the 10 degree worst case wobble angle. I'll play this a couple times. Um, we can see that immediately the disc with no wobble uh, has more lift and goes higher and it lofts and stays in the air for about twice the duration of the throw um, with that 10 degrees of wobble angle. Running again, and we can see the disc with the 10 degrees of wobble angle wobbles initially, and then that wobble sort of damps out, but it's already moving down and to the left. So it has a pretty significant impact on the flight, especially when we consider moderate to long distance throws. So in conclusion, uh, DFBI embedded rotation was able to provide a pretty straightforward solution for coupled flow and motion. SimCenter Cloud HPC allowed for much faster solution times and pretty seamless macro implementation. And we found that off-axis rotation can negatively impact the flight characteristics of an ultimate frisbee. Um, this includes a reduced distance by up to one third and an increased left to right shift um, of about two meters, at least for the throw we study. These impacts are minimized at short distances 10 to 12 meters. Uh, so the reduction of this off-axis rotation is mostly important for moderate to long distance throws. Here are my references, both that thesis and the Star CCM user guide for DFBI. And with that, I will hand it back to Adam and we'll take any questions. Excellent. Thank you, Peter. That was very good. And we do have some questions, and we have one from just um, oh, from Landon. He, he asked, "Do we have any plans for physical testing and correlation?" Um, I would suggest the answer is no. But tell me, tell me what you think, Peter. What if you if you want to do any further work with this? Yeah, yeah, I would love to do some physical correlation. Um, it would probably take finding a nice big open indoor space and setting up cameras and throwing a frisbee back and forth uh, a fair amount of times. Uh, but if anyone has interest in doing it, I would be very open to it. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Um, oh, wait, hang on. We've got more questions here. Oh, in the chat. Um, excellent. R Ray, Ray just liked the presentation. Thanks, Ray. I, I actually have a question for you, for you as well, Peter. If, if you, mm -hmm. um, and it really comes from our conversation earlier about, you know, the history of, of Frisbees. They, you know, when they first came out, they were flat discs called the, the Pluto platter, um, and mm -hmm. then um, Whammo put the the ridges on the top of it. Um, do you, do you think Star would be capable of modeling the differences and seeing why they flew differently? Definitely, yeah. I think uh, I was actually speaking with Chris earlier about this, um, and it would be possible to, you know, explicitly model those small ridges. You'd have to increase the mesh resolution, and it would take a lot longer to run. Or you could potentially uh, implement a roughness model on where the ridges are present to sort of simulate that effect. Um, I'm somewhat skeptical as to the impact that it has, um, mostly because we don't see any of those sorts of ridges in disc golf, um, where the design of the disc has been, you know, much more advanced and varied. Uh, my hunch is that it's maybe more of a grip thing and that it's just easier to grip and catch and throw the disc with those ridges, but we'd have to test out and see. Okay, excellent. Thank you. And, and, and obviously a follow-on question from that same line is, you know, do you think that Frisbees um, flex much during flight and, and, and is FSI appropriate to, to you know, to, to try and capture that? Yeah, from personal experience, discs do deform both right after a throw, if it's thrown with enough force. Um, sometimes when they're caught or if they hit the ground, they will definitely flex and bend. I know Star CCM has a tool for deformable VFBI bodies, um, but that might add a bit too much in terms of computational cost for you know an, an exploration of, of this level, but it would certainly be possible. Right, I get, it gets expensive compute time and everything else as, as you go into more details, doesn't it? And, and I guess the question that everyone must have is, how do we throw a Frisbee without inducing wobble? What's the technique? 
that's a great question, and it's one that I'm still still figuring out as I as I learn and get better at the game. Uh, a lot of it is just practice and feel, and learning how to uh, release the disc smoothly, and you know, rotate your wrist in the same plane as the disc when you release it. And uh, it's there's only so much we can do by thinking about it analytically. So much of the actual learning to throw the disc is done by you know, yeah, repetition and feel. Right. Excellent. All right. Well, I appreciate those answers. If anyone's got any last minute questions, please let us know now. Otherwise, we will we will wrap up the webinar. Thanks a lot, everyone, for joining us. Um, and this will be recorded and it will be put on ATA's website. So if you want to go and look at this later in any detail, um, you certainly can do. And all attendees will get an email of, of where to find that. So we appreciate you joining. Thanks very much and have a good afternoon.